apologies for the later start of the program. Maybe that for you in the quality of the presentation. Um, but I had no idea rush hour would be so bad. But I did from So anyway, I would just like to go ahead and get started. Uh, and to do that, I wanted to. I wanted to start the way um, by playing a clip, a historic clip, uh, that I think is a way that we always start most of our programs. And those of you, once you start hearing it, will this should be familiar. <laughs> For others, they would say, well, looking at the life that he lived, he really didn't identify himself as a Muslim. He never really claimed Islam as a religion, or really no religion at all, until he was in prison and was introduced to a uh, movement called the Nation of Islam in 1948 that underwent a kind of conversion experience. And so for them, for the people who look at that moment, well, they would say, well, his journey of faith began in 1948. Others will say, well, he was in prison. He really didn't you know, have a chance to act on that uh, conversion experience. So it isn't until he gets out of prison in 1952 and becomes a full-fledged member of the Nation of Islam that he really uh, works on behalf of the Nation of Islam, that his journey 
really began as an, an independent person outside of the prison. Now, um, and we'll get a little bit into this, there are many people who feel that the Nation of Islam, because of its theological differences with what we would call classical Islam, that the Nation of Islam is in fact, or was in fact not a Muslim movement. And so some people would say that Malcolm's journey uh, of faith in Islam doesn't actually begin until uh, 1964 when he makes his trip to Mecca uh, to perform the Hajj. And there, there are writings that uh, Malcolm, uh, in his own autobiography, kind of lends credence to this idea because he suggests that it wasn't until he went to make the Hajj, when he was called upon by the Hajj court uh, and other officials to demonstrate his knowledge of Islam, that it wasn't until that moment that he realized or felt that the time that he had spent prior to that was not, um, uh, some, uh, was not time that resembled uh, the kind of rituals and practices that uh, was being asked of him uh, when he went to make Hajj. And so it depends you know, how you really define religion or how you define Islam when you look at uh, uh, how or determining when Malcolm's journey of faith begins. So the second thing we have to ask is how do we view Malcolm X's life? Um, and there are um, you know, a few ways that people have viewed Malcolm's life, and he's kind of helped this with his autobiography, and one is to view his life as a series of epiphanies, right? That he, while he's in prison, his family visits him and writes to him and tells him about the nation of Islam, and this is a kind of mind-opening experience for him to kind of process the uh, experiences he had as a young person and in prison, and so this was a kind of epiphany. Then there's another turning point uh, when uh, he discovers that his mentor in the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, had fathered children outside of his marriage to his first wife, uh, Clara, uh, and this is a kind of uh, great disappointment for Malcolm, that you know, his, the faith that he had in Elijah Muhammad as a moral figure was damaged by his coming into this knowledge. Um, and then finally, his decision to leave the Nation of Islam and his decision to make the pilgrimage to Mecca where he writes about it as though it is you know, the greatest eye-opening, mind-opening, broadening experience that he's ever had, and so this is an epiphany. So there, there are people who uh, really look at Malcolm's lives as a series of stages, right? From Malcolm Little, which is the name he was born, and then these names kind of match these different stages, so there's Malcolm Little, which is his birth name, there's Detroit Red, which was his street name when he was a, a petty criminal, there is um, Malcolm X, of course, is the name he takes on when he joins the Nation of Islam. And then there's al Haj Malik Shabazz, which is the final name that he is known as having completed the Hajj. And so many people really compartmentalize Malcolm's life into the categories that match these names, you know, signals by these changing epiphanies. Another way that people look at Malcolm's life is in terms of theology. And for some people, it, the only way you understand Malcolm as far as his Islam is pre-Meccan Malcolm and post-Meccan Malcolm. Uh, they see Mecca as a dividing point in his timeline because they feel it, you know, that as far as theology is concerned, his real engagement with classical Islamic theology uh, was something that really only occurred post-Mecca. So, you know, there's a way of doing Malcolm's life where, you know, for some people, his life doesn't matter until he goes to Mecca as far as Islam is concerned. A third way is um, looking at Malcolm's life from a sectarian point of view, 
uh, that, and again, Mecca becomes a kind of dividing point here in his timeline where Malcolm was a member of the Nation of Islam until uh, March of 1964 when he decides to leave and begins to seemingly gravitate towards what we would call Sunni Islam. And so uh, looking at Malcolm's membership in organizations and communities is another way of understanding his journey. However, um, I would like to think of, for us to think of Malcolm's life in an alternative way that does not break his life up into these kind of discrete, compartmentalized uh, moments triggered by epiphany, that does not uh, look at his life strictly or purely through the lens of his adherence to a theology that we may or may not define as Islam and does not look at his life as though uh, it changes radically as he moves from one sect or one uh, community to another. Uh, so I would propose we, we examine Malcolm's life for the continuity, the things that did not change. Not that those things that change uh, uh, does, don't matter, but there are significant continuities in his life when we examine his journey. Secondly, that we, when we, while we look at the importance of understanding Islam as a theology, that we also look at the importance of understanding Islam as a culture. And when I say a culture, I mean that there are a series of customs, a, a collection of customs and practices and ways of living uh, and ways of carrying oneself and, and dietary customs, customs in clothing, in appearance, in conduct, in relationship to uh, other uh, people of the opposite gender. I mean, all of these constitute Islamic culture. And I would argue that while Malcolm, at points in his life, may not have adhered to what me, we may identify as Islamic theology, um, you could argue, and I will argue, that very early on, uh, Malcolm's culture, his practices, his way of life, in fact, his deen, if you define deen as way of life, his way of life was very Islamic, even before the theology of Islam came into play as we would understand it. And finally, uh, as opposed to looking at Malcolm from a sectarian view, as far as him joining one community and then moving to another community, I would propose and argue tonight that we look at Malcolm from the context of, being, of him being a member of the Ummah, or the global Muslim community, because from the very beginning of his journey to Islam, that is how he understood himself. And so uh, to start, we begin the story with Malcolm in prison. Uh, and for those of you familiar with the general trajectory of Malcolm's life, um, you know, his family, as a young child, his father was killed. Um, uh, many people believe, and there's, there's enough evidence to suggest that he was killed as a result of foul play. His parents were activists and uh, political activists in Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was a black nationalist movement, a mass movement uh, in the 1920s uh, that was geared towards building independent black organizations and institutions and businesses for black people uh, rather than uh, having them succumb to the kinds of racist attacks that black people in America were uh, victims of. And his father was killed at an early age. His mother had a nervous breakdown that was institutionalized. And Malcolm and his siblings were split up and sent to foster homes. Malcolm goes to live with a white foster family. He's going to uh, school, and he goes as far as eighth grade. And Malcolm is actually quite popular in school. Even though he's the only black child in his school, the, his peers already see in him leadership qualities. He's elected to class president. Uh, everyone, you know, he's very popular. So even, you know, early Malcolm Little already had innate qualities 
that would serve him later in life. However, Malcolm's dreams are somewhat broken when he's talking to his uh, teacher, and his teacher's asking him, you know, Malcolm, what would you like to do or be when you grow up? And Malcolm says, a lawyer. And his teacher says to him, you know, that's just not a realistic uh, aspiration for you and your people. You should, you know, aim for something like carpenter or something else that's more realistic. And uh, Malcolm pretty much gives up on school and moves to Boston to live with his half-sister, Ella Collins. And while he's in Boston, he's completely taken by the urban scene in Boston and he begins to participate in the urban culture. And this is where he takes on the life of a petty criminal. Um, he eventually is arrested with his partner in crime named Malcolm, also named Malcolm, Malcolm Jarvis, and they're sent to prison. And it is while in prison, Malcolm receives a letter from his uh, brother Philbert. And his brother Philbert says to him, you know, I know a way to get out of jail. And Malcolm, of course, is like, what? There's a way to get out of jail. And Philbert begins to tell him to pray to someone or a, an entity named Allah. And that if he were to embrace Islam, this would be his way out of a mental prison. So Malcolm basically shut Philbert down, like, you know, don't preach to me. I don't, you know, I don't want to talk about religion. He was, his nickname in prison was Satan. He was the opposite of religious. But Philbert, another a sibling of Malcolm, Hilda, and another sibling of Malcolm, Reginald, they, they continue working on Malcolm and introducing him to this new community that they had all joined, uh, the Nation of Islam. And Malcolm begins reading more and more, and the teachings of the Nation of Islam begin to click with his personal experiences, and so he undergoes a conversion. Now, how many people have seen Spike Lee's movie, Malcolm X? Okay, well, put that on your Netflix queue, for those of you who have not. Um, it, is a, it is not a perfect film, um, but it is one of Spike Lee's best films, and it is, it is a fairly, um, you know, well done dramatization of Malcolm's life. So, uh, for those of you who have seen it, this scene will look familiar. For those of you who have not, I'm going to set it up for you. Is there, I don't know if we can dim the lights, but I'm not even going to try to mess with that. Um, <laughs> um, this is a scene that actually takes place um, uh, while Malcolm is struggling with religion. And he describes in his autobiography this scene that is portrayed in Spike Lee's film. I received a letter that day when I realized my mind. The dear holy apostle wrote to me a nobody. I have come to give you something which can never be taken away from you. I pray to you a sense of your own word. The word of what human being, the knowledge of self. It was like a blind eye, and I became aware that he was in the with me. He wore a dark suit, and on his face I saw a wisdom and pain so old and deep that I could scarcely look at him. But I know what his name he was like this. I tell you. Somebody different than Elijah Muhammad. He says in his autobiography 
Uh, it was the next night as I lay on my bed, I suddenly with a start became aware of a man sitting beside me in my chair. Uh, he, had a, he had on a dark suit. I remember I could see him as plainly as I see anyone I look at. He wasn't black and he wasn't white. He was light brown skin, an Asiatic cast of countenance, and he had oily black hair. I looked right into his face. I didn't get frightened. I knew I wasn't dreaming. I couldn't move. I didn't speak. And he didn't. I couldn't place him racially, other than I knew he was a non-European. I had no idea whatsoever who he was. He just sat there. Then suddenly, as he had come, he was gone. The person that Malcolm is describing is this person, W. Faraz Muhammad. And according to the Nation of Islam, W. Faraz Muhammad was an Arab of, of biracial parentage who came to uh, black people in Detroit in 1930 to return them back to their quote unquote original selves and culture and religion and name and God. And as the Nation of Islam evolved, this uh, person, Farad Muhammad, be, was be, uh, identified by people in the Nation of Islam at that time in the theology as God in person. And so uh, Malcolm never says anything more about this experience he has, he has in prison. And most people who deal with Malcolm's religiosity or his religious life are not really sure how to process this experience. Uh, it has to do with whether, whether or not you believe that people can have these kinds of intense spiritual experiences, uh, or do you believe that Malcolm was lying when he said this because he wanted to, you know, there's, you know, there's a story of, of Paul going down the road and, and he sees the image of Jesus, uh, or he's Saul and then he becomes Paul once he sees the image of Jesus and that kind of gives him his commission to build the church of, of Christ. And maybe Malcolm was kind of reimagining that story for himself. So it all depends on what you think Malcolm was doing when he was telling this story. Now, as someone who studies religious experiences, um, I am willing to take Malcolm at his word that he actually had this experience. He was, after all, in prison. He was under a kind of intense pressure. Um, he had begun fasting. He had begun reading and consuming as much as he could about the community that he had encountered in the Nation of Islam. And he was struggling to learn how to pray. So it's quite possible that someone in this state of spiritual uh, meditation would have an experience like this. Now, why do I bring this up? Because I think um, you, when you talk about Malcolm's religious experience, uh, it, even if you don't consider this Islamic, right? And of course, there are people who would have a problem with the anyone being identified as God in person because that goes against uh, what is one of the fundamental premises of Islam, it's called shirk, right? Associating anyone with Allah. So put that aside. Even if you say, okay, this was not Islam, then we have to come to terms with what this was. And I argue it was a faith experience because what happens after is that we are introduced to Malcolm, the Muslim in prison who is actively um, working to establish a Muslim identity. Shortly after he really takes on this uh, identity of, of being a Muslim, Malcolm begins protesting for a better treatment for Muslim inmates. Now he's, he's like one, uh, and he gets his friends, uh, his associates to join, so there are four of them in this prison. And in uh, one paper, uh, the Boston Herald in April of 1950, they have a story about this that says four convicts turned Muslims get cells looking to Mecca. And it says, you know, four convicts, four, uh, I'm sorry, four convicts, four convicts uh, who were transferred recently from the state prison to Zorfa prison colony were back at the prison yesterday having become Muslims. 
In the meantime, according to their own assertion, they demanded a special diet, special jobs, and special quarters facing east in accordance with Muslim practice. So whether or not theologically you feel Malcolm has begun his journey to Islam, I would argue culturally he has. I would argue that there is a continuity that begins now in terms of his activism as a Muslim. And I would argue that whether or not we want to parse the theological distinctions between the nation of Islam and the global super tradition of Islam, it is clear at this point in time, Malcolm considered himself part of that Ummah. He considered himself Muslim. And not only did he write the uh, prison authorities requesting this special treatment, but he actually threatened to contact the Egyptian consulate uh, to protest the treatment of Muslim inmates in the prison. And here's another um, article that covers the same you know, uh, thing, that they've grown beards, they won't eat pork, and they demand east-facing cells for their prayers to Allah. So as far as uh, I can see in, in terms of this research, it's clear that Malcolm has begun his journey to Islam while in prison. Now, the most significant experience that happens to Malcolm, of course, is his travel to what we call the Muslim world, Africa and the Middle East. Many people uh, identify this trip, or these travels, as the turning point in Malcolm's Islam. And they, they look at this 90, 1964 trip to Mecca. However, um, what many people do not know is that Malcolm traveled to the Middle East uh, and, and went, met with representatives of various African and, and Arab countries in 1959 when he was sent as an emissary of Elijah Muhammad. So, you know, Malcolm doesn't leave the Nation of Islam until 1964, but a whole five years before, he's already traveled to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Sudan, Nigeria, and Ghana. And while he is there, he encounters Muslims, including Muslims who would have, quote unquote, appeared white. And so the question we have to ask uh, when we read this is, why does Malcolm write about his Hajj experience in 1964 as though this is the first time he's been there? as though this is the first time encountering Muslims in the quote-unquote Muslim world, as though this is the first time he's encountering uh, Muslims who are not black or not African-American. Uh, he had done all of that in 1960, I'm sorry, in 1959. And in fact, he did this trip in July of 1959, and it was time he was supposed to make Hajj in 1959. Uh, but he, two things happened. One is he got food poisoning while he was in Egypt, so that delayed his <coughs> departure from Egypt, so he wasn't able to make it to Mecca in time. And the second thing is that he, he felt that it was more appropriate for Elijah Muhammad as the leader of the Nation of Islam to be the first person from the nation to make that pilgrimage. And Elijah Muhammad actually makes Umrah later uh, that year. Uh, but while Malcolm is in Egypt, he meets with Anwar Sadat, who is a, a rising uh, member of the political party that um, served uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser. He was a guest of the head of state of Egypt. And so Malcolm already is being exposed to this, um, this world. And this mention of this trip gets basically a one paragraph mention in his autobiography. And it isn't because the trip wasn't significant, it's because I would argue that that trip doesn't fit neatly into that kind of epiphany look, the way that, we, the way that some people want to view Malcolm, the pre mecca post mecca post Malcolm. What do you do with a 1959 trip where he has some of these same encounters? And this trip was very significant, Malcolm himself writes an article, and this, this appears in the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, he's writing this article from Saudi Arabia um, where he says, you know, Arabs send warm greeting to our brothers of color in the U.S. of A. And so he is writing, talking about solidarity between Muslims in the Muslim world and African Americans in, uh, in America, in the nation of Islam. 
Uh, so this 1959 trip is very significant. <clears throat> the second thing actually also happens in 1959 uh, at this meeting at the mosque in Harlem uh, in, on, in August of 1959. And this, uh, this is the same meeting where the opening prayer that I played for you that was recited by uh, Imam or at the time Minister Wallace Muhammad is this occurs at this meeting. And I want to play um, another excerpt from that speech where Minister Wallace Muhammad actually gives instruction or is teaching the members of the Nation of Islam how to perform the Salat. Thank <laughs> you. 
uh, the nation of Islam and makes that decision known in March of 1964 where he announces his intention to make the Hajj in April of that year. And this is the most, probably the most celebrated document of Malcolm's life is the letter he writes from Mecca. And I pulled a few excerpts and these are the more popularly quoted excerpts of the letter uh, where Malcolm says, during the past 11 days here in the Muslim world, I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, and slept in the same bed or on the same rug while praying to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. And in the words, and in the actions and in the deeds of the white Muslims, I felt the same sincerity that I felt among the black African Muslims of Nigeria, Sudan, and Ghana. We were truly all the same brothers because their belief in one God had removed the white from their minds, the white from their behavior, and the white from their attitude. Now, many people cite this letter to say, you know, bravo, Malcolm has finally come around. This is what Islam is about. It is what Islam has always been about. And, you know, he's rejected the kind of racial lens of the nation of Islam. And I think all of that is true. However, I think it's really interesting to note that he puts white in quotes, because those are his quotes. He puts white in quotes. And he says, I want to highlight this portion where he says, belief in one God had removed the white from their minds, the white from their behavior, and the white from the attitude. Now, why does he, what, what does he mean by that? Why does he put white in quotes? Because what Malcolm is moving towards quite presciently, I mean, he's decades ahead of scholars on this in 1964. He's moving towards a view of race not as a biological, uh, uh, essential quality, but as a social construction. That racial identity, the phenotype is biologically determined, but the, the meaning that is applied to that phenotype, the meaning that is applied to that appearance is a socially, politically, economically constructed identity. And Malcolm feels that the identity of white, because you know, white didn't exist anywhere in any other part of the world. Uh, people who came to America, they came as Irish, they came as, as Italian, they came as uh, Anglo-Saxon, they came as Jews. Um, but once they get to America, there is a process by which people historically and contemporaneously become white. And what does that process entail? What does it mean to become white in America? Well, the first wave of people to become white were the Anglo-Saxons, and they claimed whiteness and the privileges that went along with whiteness. And then came the Irish. And when the Irish first came, they weren't accepted as white. They were, you know, you, it, 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 in the 19th century, they had signs up saying, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Uh, Irish people were not accepted as being white in America until they went through this process by which they became white. Then the Italians came, and then Jews came. So there were these waves of immigrants who become white. Now Malcolm seizes upon this idea that whiteness is not a fixed biological identity. It is a socially constructed identity that is based on privilege and power. And he is arguing that a belief in one God, as, as Islam teaches, would remove not white skin, not blue eyes, not blonde hair, but the mentality, this uh, a mentality of white superiority that is oftentimes attached to those biological uh, qualities. And so in closing, in looking at Malcolm's legacy, uh, whether you look at Malcolm as Malcolm X in the Nation of Islam or Malcolm as al Haj Malik Shabazz, it is undeniable that his lifeline, his timeline, 
regardless because if you look at it as a series of epiphanies or as a continuity, one of those continuities is the struggle against racism, a struggle that he eventually married to um, his belief in Islam. Another is sexism. In one of his last written pieces of correspondence before he was killed, Malcolm was corresponding with a man by the name of Saeed Ramadan, who is Tyus Ramadan's father. Um, for those people familiar with the scholar Tyus Ramadan, uh, his father was the uh, head of the Islamic Center in Switzerland. And Malcolm had visited there in his travels, and they had sent Malcolm a list of questions. And, and Malcolm wrote the answers. And one of, of his answers, uh, Malcolm says, in every Middle East or African country I have visited, I notice the country is as advanced as its women are, or as backward as its women. By this I mean in areas where the women have been pushed into the background and kept without education, the whole area or country is just as backward, uneducated, and underdeveloped. Where the women are encouraged to get education and play more active role in all around affairs of the community and country, the entire people are more active, more enlightened, and more progressive. This, in my opinion, thus, in my opinion, the Muslim religious leaders of today must reevaluate and spell out with clarity the Muslim position on education in general and education for women in particular. Malcolm, from his travels, as well as his experience in the African American community, had arrived at a position that would have challenged sexism in the Muslim world, as well as in America. Third, is Malcolm felt that the focus of his mission should be what Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth, the people that Malcolm called the least of the society the most despised and rejected. And this goes all the way back to his prison ministry and activism, because who would have thought to go into prison and reach anyone in prison with the message of Islam? Who would have thought that someone in prison would have the potential to emerge out of that prison and be one of the leading builders of a community organization and go on to debate scholars at Harvard University, at Yale, at Columbia University, at Brown University, at Oxford. This is someone who um, would have been cast off by many people who consider themselves Muslim missionaries. But Malcolm's experience in the Nation of Islam taught him that there was great potential in the African American community for Islam, especially among those who felt that the society had failed them. And finally, um, and this I think is really important, Malcolm became an advocate of justice regardless of what people's belief system was. In one of his famous addresses, uh, the Ballad or the Bullet speech in April of 1964, he says, this afternoon it's not our intention to talk religion. We're going to forget religion. If we bring up religion, we'll be in an argument. And the best way to keep away from arguments and differences is to put your religion at home, in the closet. Keep it between you and your God. Because if it hasn't done anything more for you than it has, you need to forget it anyway. Malcolm was not saying to ignore religion in your personal life. But he understood that the quest for justice had to transcend religious differences. And in fact, one of the main tenets of the Nation of Islam, when he was a member of the Nation of Islam, said in its quote, Muslim program, which is a list of beliefs, says, we believe in justice for all, whether in God or not. And I think this is a critical way of understanding Malcolm, that he didn't abandon Islam, he didn't abandon his personal faith, but he saw his faith as something that directed him to a larger project, a project that fought against racial injustice, a project that fought against sexism, a project that focused on the most needy in the society 
and a project that saw itself having the beneficiaries of the people benefiting from his mission regardless of what their belief in God was. And this, I believe, is Malcolm's journey of faith, a journey that began, I would argue, long before Mecca, long before he came out of prison. In fact, an, a journey that began from birth. So I guess if there are any questions. Okay, if you'd like I'm gonna put this right here. Um, we're gonna take questions on the questions for the next ten minutes and then um, then we'll break into five minutes from there. So um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and we'll bring them to you. I don't know. So your question is? Uh, Malcolm X said that every black man who's received an education in this country, like the war, yeah. any other black scholar, has felt inferiority and hate while they were receiving education. Uh, I just want to know what you make of that. Well, I mean, I think that part of that has to do with the historical time period that Malcolm came out of, where the educational system you know, didn't have the kind of diversity uh, of experiences represented. And so, uh, you know, not, a, you know, maybe up until the last 20, 30 years, in some, in some schools it hasn't even changed, where when you read, you know, a study of American history, for example, it's a history of great accomplishments uh, by people who don't look like you, <laughs> um, who are usually men, right? And so if you're not one of those people, after a kind of, constant steady diet of that you know uh, education you begin thinking that you come from a people who've accomplished nothing right and I think that's what Malcolm was speaking to and uh, when he um, you know was inspired by you know people always marveled at how Malcolm you know while he was in prison he started reading the dictionary and he started reading all these books on history and philosophy and you know um, that he was this autodidact, like he was a self-taught person. Like what an amazing person to do that.